Okay. Now it is to look into a problem and see how it works. <coughs> Let's see how it works. Let's now imagine that these two companies have <coughs> a general director in each of them that are friends. <coughs> and that happens. So there are two players <coughs> And these two players now and then meet as friends, and they go salmon fishing together. So they just go along the riverside, discuss this delicate problem, and they sit down at uh, the riverbank and look at the river, and they just start to discuss, mm, is it a good idea to when we return to play high price and we don't say it to anybody else. You can see around here there is nothing here. Nobody here. So we just agree. We play high price. And then not to each other. And they're good friends. So <coughs> then they leave and they meet with the board. And the head of the board will say, hmm? uh, <coughs> Do you think that General Electric will play high price? He nods and he tells the story. We were salmon fishing together. We agreed that we are going to play high price. Then the head of the board would say, Hmm. That stupid guy. <laughs> if he will be so stupid that he will play high price, then I just force you. I'm the head of the board. We will play low price. And instead of 100, we will gain 140. And your stupid friend will not go salmon fishing with you next year. But I don't mind. <coughs> So, because they cannot sit down, they are not allowed to write a contract because of the antitrust law, <coughs> the incentives to break that contract that they had uh, among each other when they sat there at the riverbank, to break that contract is very, very, very profitable. <laughs> And since these head of the board will be driven by profit maximization, then it's not easy to end up in 100-100. And you are not allowed to contract. <coughs> and this is one topic that I will teach over when I meet the ferry sector, the 13th of September. The ferry sector will have a seminar in Molna, and that will be a national seminar. And they'll ask me to come out there and <coughs> to have <coughs> a presentation of this game theoretic approach, because they are in exactly the same position. <coughs> there are a few players, they play over prices. It's a competitive tendering process, <coughs> and both want high price, high price. Why come they end up in low price, low price? Because they cannot, <coughs> when they play, <coughs> they just deliver <coughs> in the competitive tendering process. They just deliver a sealed bid. <coughs> that sealed bid is in an envelope. And uh, when that has been given, it is either high price or low price. <coughs> if it's high price <coughs> and the other bidder has given low price bid, the high price player will lose. There will be no contract. If they both play low price, low price, it's 50-50 that each of them will win. 
and therefore they will never ever play high price high price because they will no, have no incentives for that and, and they are not allowed to contract they just have one bid in a sealed envelope <coughs> and when <coughs> these bids will be open somebody will say that this is the one with the lowest price that will be the winner that will be the winner <coughs> and what I will lecture over is how many players do we need <coughs> to be certain that there will actually be enough pressure enough competition to end up in low price low price <coughs> in the long run <coughs> can the players learn by playing over and over and over again in a learning process where they in the long run since they have much more information <coughs> than <coughs> they have they have much more information than the other part that will sign the contract and therefore they might learn in the long run to end up <coughs> in a signal game they just can send each other signals if you put a low price on this contract high price on this contract I will put a high price on that contract <coughs> and through a signaling game they might end up to signal in a way <coughs> that not is that easy for the antitrust body to <coughs> see and <coughs> to do something with. So why is this called the Princess Dilemma game? <coughs> Next one. Just to summarize that briefly, can you see that this is two players out there that has been taken for drug dealing? Mumbles and Big Boy and they are put in in separate rooms and, uh, and there will be <coughs> two alternative <coughs> moves either to confess or don't confess if both confess, confess they will have six years each but if none of them confess they will have three years each So why come that they don't collude? Here, if they were able to collude, they don't confess and each of them will have three years. But if one confess and the other don't, <coughs> the one that confess will only have one year and the one that don't will have ten. Can you see that this is exactly the prisoner's dilemma again. If you put a circle, you end up <coughs> in confess, confess. So they both confess and they will be put into jail for six years. Because sitting in separate rooms, they can't collude. <coughs> and since none of them will dare to play don't confess because he will run the risk to have 10 years mm. instead of 6 4 more years mm. this is the reason why this is a business element <coughs> and then we will later on try to find what can we do to change the rules of the game so that we end up in colluding because none of the players out there likes to be in a prisoner's dilemma solution 
don't really like to have six years instead of three. <coughs> How can you change the rules of the game? That is here very simple. And in practice, in real life, you can see that too. If <coughs> to confess will be confined, combined <coughs> with <coughs> an extra go further problem for the one confessing if you confess <coughs> there will some be somebody out there that just will kill you when you leave the prison <coughs> if that happens they don't confess <coughs> then both of them will play <coughs> the solution don't confess because <coughs> to confess <coughs> that is a problem after <laughs> leaving <laughs> prison. <laughs> and just so far, don't remember, don't forget that every time when we are playing the Princess Dilemma game, the players out there will look for strategies to change the rules of the game to end up in colluding. And that is what's going on in the ferry sector too. They try over time to change the rules of the game to end up in a solution where you are closer to colluding. And that will give you higher profit. Next one. Here is <coughs> another game where if you look at the players, you will definitely see if you are a good player that here you see no national rule. Why come? Let's start at low price for McDonald's and heavy advertising. <coughs> and we end up in the cell 55-45. Is that the national rule? Why come? Because McDonald's by playing heavy advertising can increase with fine. <coughs> so we are down to heavy advertising, heavy advertising. <coughs> Could that be a national premium? Why come? <coughs> Burger King can play low price. So we move to the left. <coughs> and now <coughs> we are at heavy advertising, no price. 55.50. Is that the national equilibrium? No. Why come? Burger King can play low price. 60 instead of 55. So <coughs> we are at low price, low price. Is that the national equilibrium? No. Why come? Burger King can play heavy advertising. And instead of 35, you have 45. <coughs> so we are back where we started. And we ask ourselves, why come? We have no solution. <coughs> so on normal form, in this game, we did not find any national group. How can we deal with that? <coughs> now <coughs> we are going to learn <coughs> in this kind of game <coughs> that's often called uh, tossing penny games uh, and not the princess dilemma game. There will be no solution. You go in a circle. <coughs> no simple solution 
now simple stay one solution <coughs> and <coughs> from now on you are aware of if we randomize and if we play mixed strategies we always have a Nash agreement once more another technique to find a solution we randomize instead of playing no price and we end with thing we place the probability of no price the probability of heavy advertising and both players they don't play over no price or heavy advertising but they play over probabilities then we randomize and next picture <coughs> and now we are down to four cents <coughs> where the two players can either play low price or heavy advertising and you still see that here is no national equilibrium <coughs> no national equilibrium <coughs> and what we actually do now is to say that McDonald's have a probability P for playing no price and a probability 1 minus P for playing heavy advertising and Burger King has a probability Q for playing no price <coughs> and a probability 1 minus Q to play heavy advertising <coughs> now we have randomized and we always can find an extra equilibrium where we don't decide on low price or heavy advertising but we look for the decision what probability what will be the probability for choosing low price what will be the probability for choosing heavy advertising <coughs> and the simple technique now is from the textbook that instead of maximizing <coughs> payoffs you maximize expected payoffs and what is expected payoffs that is payoffs multiplied with the probability <coughs> and every time when you play over probabilities <coughs> you always have the Nash agreement. <coughs> and <coughs> I don't want to prove that for you mathematically <coughs> because that's not simple. You just have to believe the textbook <coughs> and believe me that that is proved once and for all by Nash. <coughs> he did it. <coughs> And there is no reason for us to <coughs> to do that after him. <coughs> then we go to the next figure. Now <coughs> we have one simple way to find the Nash equilibrium when we deal with <coughs> a randomized problem first we ask what is the probability for McDonald's to play no price we call that P and then <coughs> we just <coughs> intuitively <coughs> say that if McDonald's as a player should play according to maximize his own benefit he should put 
Burger King in a week, uh, in as weak as position as possible. So if McDonald's will be smart, he will just play over probabilities. Just that probability that will make Burger King indifferent between playing low price and heavy advertising. <coughs> and if Burger King will be indifferent, then <coughs> McDonald's has in a way put him in a weak position because whatever he do, he will have the same expected outcome. Whatever he do, he will end up with the same expected outcome. <coughs> that is to put him in a weak position, because it doesn't matter what he do, or what he does. <coughs> and <coughs> you can then see that to come up for McDonald's with expected payoff for Burger King, <coughs> You put <coughs> 35 multiplied with the probability, P. And then <coughs> you have 50 multiplied with mon minus P. That will be <coughs> the expected payoff for Burger King playing low price. Then you put that equal to the expected payoff for Burger King playing <coughs> heavy advertising. And that is 45 <coughs> multiplied with PT and 40 multiplied with 1 minus. Now you have been smart <coughs> and you end up with prices or probabilities <coughs> equal to 1 half can you see that? You just solve that equation and you find the probability and <coughs> that solution is a Nash equilibrium. And <coughs> you do exactly the same for Burger King and that is the formula you find <coughs> the lower part of the page <coughs> and you put the expected benefit payoff for Burger King equal to playing low price equal to playing heavy advertising and you find that the probability is one third and that is now in mixed strategies, the Nash equilibrium. So now you have learned how to find Nash equilibrium in the simple business dilemma game. And this is a marketplace where it's unstable. You go in a circle, there will be no stable solutions. And out there, in real life, <coughs> there will be many markets where, at the margin, there will be no simple Nash equilibrium. <coughs> and you have to look for a Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies, where you play over probability <coughs> instead of <coughs> playing a discrete choice. <coughs> Next one. <coughs> now, <coughs> we move into <coughs> the next game. <coughs> and that is, instead of the simultaneous game on normal form <coughs> that we have played so far. <coughs> and with simultaneous, we mean <coughs> that they play over prices <coughs> just
just like in the competitive tendering process, <coughs> one seed bid, they play over prices <coughs> simultaneously. <coughs> and <coughs> now we turn to another kind of <coughs> of uh <coughs> games and we just start with two players Jerry and Ben that can play top bottom left right <coughs> and you see the pay of matrix here <coughs> and you can look for a Nash equilibrium <coughs> but now we change this game into a sequential game. So far, we have moved simultaneously. <coughs> now, one of the players moves first. <coughs> and the other player will move second and know exactly what the first player has done. <coughs> and now, we need a decision tree. This is a decision tree. And this is a very simple one. <coughs> and we now have left Ben to move first. And <coughs> that is a node where you see B is the first node <coughs> where Ben can either <coughs> move left all right, and that is a branch, and <coughs> if Ben moves left, that branch ends up in a new node called Jerry 1, G1. <coughs> now Jerry can either play top, and <coughs> Jerry will play top, that branch ends up in payoff and outcome when Ben will have one, Jerry will have six. <coughs> in that outcome, the first number, one, is the payoff for Ben, <coughs> the second one for Jerry. And if Jerry plays bottom, Ben will have one. <coughs> And Jerry will have six as a payoff. <coughs> then <coughs> we go back again to Ben. That can play right. And <coughs> might end up in node Jerry 2. Jerry now can play either top or bottom. <coughs> if Jerry 2 place top <coughs> that will be critical because the payoff will be minus 2 <coughs> that is not a good solution for spam <coughs> minus 2 is a bad one <coughs> and Jerry <coughs> will end up <coughs> playing <coughs> with 0 not a very good solution for Jerry Hanger. And <coughs> finally, if Jerry plays bottom, we end up, end up with 4-4. Four four. <coughs> they will both be happy. 4-4. Four four. <coughs> this is an extensive form of a game in table 7-8 <coughs> and a decision tree. Later on, we will make use of decision trees on more complicated problems. And <coughs> decision trees are very often very helpful to formalize the problem <coughs> and to look for a good solution. <coughs> what will be the solution here? Now, for the first time, you are introduced for the technique to look for a Nash equilibrium when we <coughs> have a game on extensive form. Then we have a technique we call backward induction. Backward induction. Why come? <coughs> because
because no pen will move first and pen will ask himself if I look forward and reason backwards how can I end up in a final solution where I take advantage of being a first mover can Ben now find a way to be <coughs> the winner in the game by using the technique backward induction. <coughs> Let's now see how Ben can work this out. <coughs> ben will ask <coughs> if I play left Jerry will definitely play either top or bottom and gain six. So no problem. I definitely know that. So I can just forty that by backward induction. Then Ben would say if I play right, what will Jerry do? Hmm? Jerry will definitely know not play top because that will give a profit of zero so Jerry will play bottom <coughs> and therefore then we know <coughs> that <coughs> you can just exclude all the three alternatives you don't play left because that will only give him one. He will play right <coughs> because he know for certain that Jerry will play bottom. <coughs> so he will not lose two. He will have four. And the loser in that game <coughs> will be Jerry. Since Jerry very much would want six. But since then has taken advantage of moving first using the technique backward induction he ends up with a solution that will maximize the payoff for Ben and later on an important part of game theory is to understand uh, when is it <coughs> a good strategy to move first <coughs> and when is it a bad strategy to move first it's not always a first mover advantage and to know that you need to understand the game you are playing you need to understand the payoff matrix to understand deep enough to find the strategy <coughs> either to move first or to wait until your rival <coughs> has already moved <coughs> for instance within innovation we'll come back to this the two players will play innovation. <coughs> the one that innovate first will have to cover the cost. <coughs> and if it's easy to imitate, <coughs> it's a good strategy to wait. <coughs> Just wait and imitate. <coughs> if you can patent your product and capture a profit with a patent, then you innovate and you are not allowed to imitate <coughs> because the product will be protected by the patent. <coughs> so within innovation in general many economists have stated that instead of moving first wait until <coughs> somebody else has taken all the costs 
and if you wait long enough it's always easy to imitate and there is a literature out there saying that the winners <coughs> are the one <coughs> that specialize on imitating <coughs> but imagine if all <coughs> just play imitating there will be no innovation <coughs> so that's the problem <coughs> and imitation is a strategy imitate <coughs> Next one. Now we have moved into a game of entry. Now this game has changed from <coughs> up and down to for the first time the entry game. Ben is now a newcomer <coughs> within the fish farming industry and either <coughs> he will play enter or he will play stay out. Jerry is now the incumbent <coughs> and the incumbent Jerry is playing either <coughs> aggressive or maintain current price. What if Ben stays out? If Ben stays out, <coughs> Jerry can play aggressive <coughs> and the outcome is 1-6. Or Jerry can play maintain current price, 1.6. <coughs> and this is prices of salmon. <coughs> Aggressive, infantry, maintain current price. <coughs> so what we look for now is <coughs> can Jerry threaten Ben to stay out? Because <coughs> when he threatens, that can be seen in the lower part of this decision tree <coughs> because if Ben now <coughs> when play enter, what happens? If Ben play enters, plays enter, Jerry can try very aggress aggressive to say that <coughs> if you enter <coughs> and he can he go even further to say that if you dare to enter I will be very aggressive putting the prices down so far that you will lose two mm. then <coughs> we just have to reflect to lose two in negative profit minus two and Jerry will say, I will be so aggressive that I will be willing <coughs> to have zero profit. And you will have minus two. <coughs> and I will be happy with zero because it's so important for me that you stay out. <coughs> I want to have this market for myself. <coughs> Let's, yeah, if they play over and over and over again. <coughs> but let's now see how it works here. We play these only once now. And he tells the story. I am a very aggressive man. <coughs> and Ben will say, mm, are you that aggressive? Why come? <coughs> You should be willing to lose, to have zero, when you can either have four, and alternative six. 
why come you are that aggressive that you are willing to go that far down to zero? <coughs> Can that be rational? <coughs> then Penn will say that I can make a contract with my lawyer. I write a contract with my lawyer telling my lawyer that if Ben enters, you have my permission to play aggressive. And the lawyer will take the contract to Ben and show him that he has a contract that Jerry will play aggressive if you enter. And Ben will look at the contract and say, uh, 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 it's signed by Jerry, it seems serious, and it is a lawyer. Uh, is that a credible threat? Is it a credible threat? Let's see after the break if it's credible. Uh -uh. Uh -uh.